Live. It's Wednesday, it's 11.15 and we're live in Westminster. Seven years after the Grenfell Tower fire, the public inquiry has published its final report. But what will justice for the victims look like? The simple truth is that the deaths that occurred were all avoidable and those who lived in the tower were badly failed over a number of years and in a number of different ways by those who were responsible for ensuring the safety of the building and its occupants. Most likely, the boat collapsed very fast. The smugglers had provided no more than eight life jackets. So, if help had not arrived so fast, far more people would have faced certain death. After 12 people died off the French coast yesterday, what can be done to stop migrants crossing the channel in small boats? We will set up Great British Energy. This is a publicly owned energy company that will ensure that we have renewable energy, which is cheaper, so bills will be down permanently. That was during the election campaign, but will Labour's green energy plans really mean cheaper bills? And Keir Starmer will face questions from Rishi Sunak at Prime Minister's Questions for the first time since the summer break. Joining me to discuss all that, Labour MP Polly Billington, Conservative MP Ben Obsey jekti Gabby Hinsliff from The Guardian and Liam Halligan from The Telegraph. This is Politics Live. Welcome. Well, the second and final report into the Grenfell Tower fire disaster has been published literally in the last 10 minutes or so. It was seven years after the tragedy. It's the worst residential fire since the Second World War in which 72 people died. Uh, the chairman of the inquiry, Martin Morbick, a retired judge, in his opening remarks delivered a damning indictment. Let's take a listen. The simple truth is that the deaths that occurred were all avoidable, and those who lived in the tower were badly failed over a number of years and in a number of different ways by those who were responsible for ensuring the safety of the building and its occupants. They include the government, the tenant management organisation, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, those who manufactured and supplied the materials used in the refurbishment, those who certified their suitability for use on high-rise buildings, the architect, the principal contractor, and some of its subcontractors, in particularly uh, Harley Curtain Wall and its successor Harley Facades, some of the consultants, in particular the fire engineer Exover Warrington Fire, the local authorities' building control department, and the London Fire Brigade. Not all of them bear the same degree of responsibility for the eventual disaster, but as our reports show, all contributed to it in one way or another, in most cases through incompetence, but in some cases through dishonesty and greed. Now, the uh, families of the victims have already waited such a long time to hear Martin Morbick deliver um, his report and hear what he had to say. It could be several more years before any prosecutions actually uh, occur. Um, what does justice look like for the victims and their families? Well, I think it will need to be some kind of prosecutions. I think that's where th things are likely to go. I think one of the concerns that people will have is that well, quite often when it comes to corporate manslaughter, there's a lot of talk about it and very few prosecutions. There is obviously clearly going to be a, a bit of time where the Metropolitan Police are going mm. to look at the, the uh, findings of the inquiry in order to be able to make some of those decisions. But my concern would be we've got that... We, uh, if the legislation that we've got very rarely results in convictions, so I think we'll, we'd need to see what the judicial process will result in. Well, uh, Ben, that's certainly uh, what the front page of the I uh, is also underlining. Grenfell guilty must now be prosecuted, urge MPs and uh, survivors. Um, we, of course, don't know the full contents yet because literally it has been published, but, but your impression in terms of what justice must look like? I think looking at the, the sort of the initial announcement and the statement there from uh, from 
Martin Morbick, it's it's very clear that, that justice must be served. And, and as a party, I think we are very much going to row in behind uh, the CPS and the police in their, in their pursuit of prosecutions. We're looking at potentially another couple of years until anybody is, is brought to justice. But I would imagine that the families involved in this would definitely want closure um, and, and the effective justice to be done. Do you think Keir Starmer will just accept all the recommendations in the report, even though we haven't had sight of all of them? Do you think he should just accept them? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see what they are. I mean, none of us have, have seen the, no, the, the report in detail, and obviously he's going to make a statement in the House uh, later on today. I think, you know, going to, to what Ben said, and the, the thoughts, I think, all of us, for all, all of us have to be not only with the 72 who died, but the people who are living with the mm. consequences mm. of that. Mm. And that's the families of those people who died, but also the family, uh, people across the country who are living with the consequences of this basically structural failure, institutional failure of the regulators, of government, of the industry. I've got six tower blocks in Thanet which have waking watches mm. because... What, there's 24 hours. Because the 24 fire hours safety. in yes. order to be able... Because we currently don't have security when it comes to this fire safety. And what we saw in Dagenham only a week or so mm, ago... Which was the fire ...means that, 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 was, uh, that were 100 households lost their homes. We're, it's amazing that there were no deaths then. And that suggests that this not only is it when justice is delayed, justice is denied, it's actually people's safety... Yeah. is denied while we're continuing to manage to get these things sorted out. Well, and that is an ongoing and critical issue. As Polly has said, there is a statement, a prime ministerial statement, straight after uh, PMQs from Keir Starmer on uh, the report into the Grenfell fire disaster. We will bring that to you, certainly the uh, beginning of it, live after Prime Minister's questions. A couple of things to pick up on. Yes, there are, of course, the survivors. They themselves have waited uh, to hear this report. The trauma of the testimony of so many of those who did manage to get out uh, of the tower before it was completely uh, overwhelmed and engulfed. And this issue that government figures from March show that nearly 2,000 social housing blocks in England have life-critical problems with their external cladding still. And it's staggering. And, you know, I think the last stat I heard was that, you know, yes, remediation work has started in over 50% of the affected buildings. That's still an awful lot where work hasn't even started and, you know, hundreds where it hasn't finished. And you've got people putting their kids to bed at night in, you know, on the 30th floor of some building that you don't know is safe or not. And, you know, it is astonishing that we've, we've got to that point. And that apparently the problem is, you know, we have a lack of capacity in construction shape, we don't have enough skilled builders, we don't have enough... It's difficult to sort of disentangle some of this stuff from the fabric of the building. But seven years is an incredibly long time for it's people to, that, to be living though, with Gabby. this. It's also people being, doing that when yeah. it comes to the blame. Which is right. what we it's saw in the inquiry. It's somebody else. Which is what we saw throughout of, the inquiry. Oh, it wasn't blame. us. Yes, we did X, but look, you know, over here, that guy, that guy. You know. And the, the, that legal complexity, particularly where you've got housing associations and shared ownership, means that oh no, we just manage the building. Oh no, no, we just we just operate that bit. Mm. Oh no, no, there's people mm. who are paying money because for those waking watches, and I'm not sure yeah. that their own homes are safe. They can't move. And all of that is um, is compounding the injustice that it goes way and beyond. And you've gone out of business yeah. and so on and so on since you know since they actually put the buildings up. So I'm not saying it's easy to unravel, but I can completely understand the frustration of people who are trapped in that situation. I think it's important for a Starmer government that came in saying we will restore trust in public life. You know, I think this is yet another situation we've seen it before with the Horizon scandal, we've seen it mm. with the infected blood scandal, where you. You have to, as a citizen, as an individual, place your trust. You have to think, well, you know, somebody's inspected this building. There's building regs, guys. You know, builders know what mm. they're doing. Nobody would make me live somewhere that was actively dangerous. And that trust has been betrayed, you know, and, and government has to show people that we can do better in the future. I mean, the merry-go-round of buck passing, uh, you might call it, has gone on and on because the government, the previous uh, Conservative governments, struggled, really struggled to try and make different companies, individuals, councils accountable. Um, but some would say the government should have just coughed up the money, the billions needed to remove dangerous cladding. We well, you know, Joe, there's lots we're really good at in this country, but we're really bad at inquiries after tragedies of any kind. Look how long the inquiry into Bloody Sunday took. Mm. Look how long the COVID inquiry is taking. It's absolutely outrageous that prosecutions aren't going to begin. Defendants aren't going to even appear in court until late 2026 at the earliest, Joe, which of course is almost 10 years mm. after this inquiry. And just to uh, emphasise the points made 
so well, I thought, by Polly and Gabby. I, there's not a cigarette paper between us on this, really. There are now four hundred. There are still four thousand six hundred and thirty residential buildings in this country of eleven metres and over that still have this fl clam fl flammable cladding mm. as of the end of July. Only twenty nine percent of the buildings have had the remediation work done. So as we've heard, there are many thousands of families, including children, who are living in tower blocks, both privately owned and social housing, surrounded by material that the government has already decreed by law is unsafe. And that's why you have these crazy waking watches. Right. When it comes to concrete proposals, though, Polly, I mean, is the Labour government going to do anything uh, that is materially different to what the previous Conservative governments tried to do on a couple of fronts? Agreement with developers to contribute a minimum of £2 billion towards cladding remediation uh, and also funds from the central government directly uh, to repair and remove it from social housing. I mean, what else will the Labour government do? Well, I think we'll see what uh, the Labour government will do, our, our government will do, when Keir Starmer stands up after Prime Minister's questions and does his statement, and we'll be able to see further on that. Already, for example, Ray Angie Rayner and the minister responsible for this, in particular, Rushnara Ali, have already met with the buildings um, controlled regulator in order to be able to speed this up, because we've got the situations, again, when, uh, talking about the ones in my own constituency, where the, it's all ready to go to get this stuff done, and the buildings regulator have not signed it off. And that means people still waiting, not sure whether their places are safe. So speeding it up would be a start. Um, that I think there's a lot of impatience. Um, from people, understandably, they voted for change, they want to be able to see that mm. on, on things like this, which is a big institutional failures, we're going to have to see some of that change happen sooner rather than later. I mean, people will look... Briefly, briefly, the inquiry... Sorry, Joe, the inquiry itself has taken far too long. Mm. With, with, with respect, it took over two years mm. for the Conservatives to even uh, publish the proposals mm. for the scope of the inquiry, the proposals for the scope of the inquiry, not the actual the inquiry, what it will examine. Two years just to do that. Well, what, I think there's what, testimony a, from that, one of the survivors that if they'd known it was going to take this is long. Crazy. Yeah, if it yeah. was going to take this long, they perhaps wouldn't have supported it. Seven years, though, under Conservative governments. You can admit today, surely, it's just taken far too long. I think it has. I, I, I was on a train into London on the morning after the, the, the Grenfell Tower, and I, I, from coming through Clapham Junction, I could see the, the tower burning in the distance, and, and that feels to me like almost like a lifetime ago. Um, this inquiry, I think, has cost £231 million, and it absolutely must have an end result. You know, We must see that justice is done at the end of this process, that we get clarity on the path forward, and that those people who are still living with the... The, the nightmare of being in, in buildings um, that have flammable cladding on them, as well as the families who have been impacted by this, are seen to get the right result. All right, let's talk about uh, what happened yesterday in the channel. Have a look at this headline, BBC News. 12 die after migrant boat sinks in the channel. Um, the boat was clearly overloaded. Amongst the 12 who lost their lives, uh, there was a pregnant woman and at least six children. Now, we don't know uh, the nationalities of all those who died um, in the channel, but many, we are told, uh, were from Eritrea. Um, it's the deadliest loss of life in the channel this year, but that hasn't stopped another crossing uh, earlier this morning. We can show you pictures here of people trying uh, off the coast of France to get into another overcrowded uh, boat. Uh, you can see them there wading out into the water. Uh, it is, in fact, the boat eventually uh, intercepted uh, by the French Coast Guard vessel. Uh, but as I say, it hasn't stopped literally within 24 hours following uh, the deaths reported yesterday of another boat. There is the uh, French Coast Guard there. Um, let's have a look at the front uh, page of the Daily Mail. How long uh, before the vile smuggling gangs are stopped. Um, the crossings are continuing, um, Polly. Labour has promised to smash the gangs. How long will that take? I just, I just keep looking at those, those pictures and just thinking about those children who aren't with us anymore because of the desperation of their families and the, crimin and the evil criminal gangs mm. who, are, who are exploiting them. That's why we want to be able to beef up the border agency include the security services in being able to do this and spend the money that was previously spent on the Rwanda scheme to invest in cracking down on those gangs. Because it is their exploitation of people's desperation mm. that is 
that is driving a lot what of this. And we actually, do need. What does well, that actually look it like? Means not, it means. Th because this is a suggestion here that the NCA have been twiddling their thumbs the for years and doing, and doing nothing. Well, what I'm saying is it will, it will include the security services, which I think is quite important in terms of being able to have that kind of power and using the anti-terror laws, which we've previously not been using, organised criminal law, um, but if we, um, if we cr can't criminality. Stop, if we can't stop things like handguns and drugs being brought into the country, how are we suddenly going to manage to do that with criminal gangs and smuggling well, people? Well, I think what we need to do is to be able to make sure that we are allocating resources, security services resources, to t tackle these criminal gangs, which we previously have not been doing, and using that anti-terror legislation and, uh, and legislation against organised criminality, because that is what this is. Now, I know, Ben, we all, we all know that those things, we can't stop everything, but we could do a lot more than we have currently been doing should, because there's been the spending of that money. Should Labour not be looking money. at the pull factors, reasons why people are coming well, here? Well, I also I mean, think we, we need we saw, to be thinking about the, the push there. factors, we saw the and there. one of them is the, fa the fact we don't have any safe routes. And that drives that desperation to cross the channel. And that happens if people that literally well, turn up on we, the beaches. We can come on to that. In, in but let's community. focus on the demand, because clearly the demand isn't going away um, in terms of people still paying well, that's money, what, that's however what, dangerous it becomes. Well, that's what I mean about having to have some safe routes. Remember the five point plan that, that, that the Labour Party stood on and the platform that we stood on in order to be able to get elected included commitment mm. to, uh, to safe routes, yeah. greater cooperation with our neighbours and to identify some of the, so the, the causes of this and to, to step up internationally to be able to tackle some of the conflicts. People are, not, not everybody, there will be people who are, who are simply fleeing or, or, or coming for economic reasons, mm. but a lot of people will be so, fleeing so desperate. So how, do, how does it stop people who are coming for economic reasons? Well, what we we'll have to do is make sure that we're no longer having those gangs there to exploit them. People are paying a lot of money to be able to get into a shonky boat and therefore end up in I mean, a very, we, very dangerous situation. We've been talking situation. about this. Stop. Yeah. The, the Prime Minister's been talking about this for a, a long time now. And we keep hearing the same things. We're going to smash the gangs, we're going to smash the gangs. He's been asked repeatedly what he's going to, be, what he's going to do with the people who are already here who can't be sent back to a safe country. Mm. And there's been no answer on that. There's thousands well, we've already of people. sent hundreds back to Brazil, for example, recently. But there are tens because, of thousands here. Yeah, and, yeah but... Ben, I what? know you're a new MP and it might be difficult to take responsibility for the previous government, but some of the things that they did, which was failing to invest in processing people so that we've got people sitting in hotels in my constituency right. because they cannot, because but, they're not being processed, when they've been that processed, is wrong. What happens to them? Well, then they need to be returned where there are safe countries. And they Well, then we'll ha need to be able to do more to be able to establish what, where mm. those safe countries so, are so and where there there is there no aren't. Plan for the well, yeah, but some, some right. people. <laughs> Some people will be there asylum no seekers, Ben. Some people will be asylum let me, seekers. Let me, will be I'm legitimate talking about those refugees. Who, I'm talking about those who aren't. Well, then, that, then if, they, if they've got a safe country then they can go back and to, then they we'll send so them So say they've to thrown them. their passport away as they come over, they've arrived here, they claim to be from a country that isn't safe, they aren't given asylum, where would you send them? Well, we'll need to send them to a safe country. We will need to establish that. So Labour are going to send people who we'll asylum to, to like a that, safe country that they're not necessarily I'm going to bring in our other two guests, but do you want to also say on behalf of the last Conservative government which spent an awful lot of time on this in terms of stopping the boats which you failed to do um, quite evidently um, this was something that you just couldn't get to grips with I think it's I think it's an enormously complex task and I think it's one that's uh, that that so far we have not seen an adequate response to a, across the board well, what is clear is that we need to see a deterrent that deterrent was removed by the Labour government. 8,000 people have crossed since they removed the deterrent. The NCA themselves have said that a deter deterrent needs to be put in place. And so far, Labour has not suggested what sort of deterrent is going to be put in place going forward. Well, let's have a look in terms of the numbers uh, so far uh, from my BBC colleague, Simon Jones. Uh, he's tweeted more than 8,100 people have reached the UK on small boats since Labour came to power. That's a drop of 16% on the same period last year, though August this year did see a long period of rough weather in the Channel. I mean, despite everything uh, that was talked about during the campaign uh, by uh, the Labour, now Labour government, those numbers are still mm. extremely high. They are. And we've seen, I mean, we've seen fluctuations before now. They often tend to have more to do with the weather than, than with yeah. policy. I think the one thing, you know, the Home Office will probably be, I would say, quietly relieved that it hasn't gone up because that was the argument a lot of people made in the run-up to the election. Oh, you know, you, you cancel the Rwanda scheme, you take away the deterrent, then numbers will go through the roof. You know, that we haven't seen that happen. So what's that telling us? It's telling us that, that the threat of a, of a Rwanda scheme that was never actually going to work in practice and never happened wasn't much of a deterrent. The but the new scheme, just one minute, Ben, the new, the new scheme, you know, the new regime hasn't acted.
detected yet as a deterrent either. We are kind of roughly where we were. Almost whatever anyone was tried, we've ended up where we were. I think the one thing that's been interesting this time is the French have responded by talking about needing a new migration treaty mm. with the UK. Mm. Now, one of the things Labour said, Polly mentioned it, one of the things Labour said during the run-in to the election was, you know, we need to cooperate. The answer to this problem lies somehow between us and France. It lies in better cooperation with the French. What that looks like, what the French would want from us in return for maybe more oh. vigorous and widespread French reinforcement. Uh, French enforcement. Money, I presume. Who knows? A lot more money, but potentially also, I think, on the French side, you often hear the argument they're drawn by the labour market in the UK. Mm. It's too well. easy to get work in the black market in the UK, and that's what pulls oh. people over. That's what they say. And, you know, it's interesting that the Home Office has started talking more recently about stepping up immigration raids on places where they know people are working mm. illegally, car washes, nail salons, that kind of thing. Liam? Yeah, I mean, it's not just car washes. It's like a lot of the construction industry and so on. Look, look at my name. I'm, I'm from immigrant stock. I spent most of my adult life arguing for the merits of, of, of immigration, of which my family have been a part. But aside just for a second from the tragedy of the small boats and the horrific um, news from, from last night, at least six children. I mean, it's yeah. just crazy. The really big issue here is legal migration. If we should just say that, just hear me out, Joe. The legal migration got up in term in, in 2022 to the equivalent of a, the city of Sheffield, one of our biggest cities, in one single year. And a lot of people at the sharp end of the labour market that are competing for housing, competing for public services, they've now got to the point where that is a real issue for them. And the political class is finally responding to that. Look what happened in the European Parliament elections. Look what's just happened in Germany with immigration being a big issue. Are and you I, saying the I focus say should be on that issue no, more no, no, no. than the... I'm just asking, it, that because the numbers are so vast... Yeah. In numerical in, terms, of course, it's legal migration yes. that is the I mean, huge the government issue. Is asking but, of this course, government. because illegal migration with the small boats, the tragedy is so visceral and mm. human and in front of our eyes as the numbers tick up every day. It's much, much more visible. Look, a few things. Labour are clearly going to have to work out what they're going to do about this. I'd say that across the European Union, the deportation success rate is up at 30%, up from 20% just last year. I do think, with regret, however distasteful it is, there will need to be some kind of third country place where claims can be processed, otherwise people just disappear into the twilight economy. And it takes 10 years on average to process these claims, by which case you know, Ill illegal immigration has worked for that person. So that's why they're paying upwards of three, four, five thousand um, pounds to sit in a, a, a boat that could be a death trap. There is a lot. Obviously, Polly's completely right. We need to preserve our safe routes. Of course, we need to. We don't well, have any yeah, yeah. We, the they're, 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 they're very, very small numbers. I agree with you. Well, uh, and, we, and we need to make sure there is a route for genuine asylum seekers. But Ben's also got a point. You know, people don't well, pay four or five grand. No, of course not. If they're an asylum no. seeker. Well, I mean, of course, we don't know, do we, well, until their applications I would say are the actually processed. And the vast majority of these people are economic migrants. But the, and animus, I understand, because it's what my mm, people did. But a lot of applications but, are processed. But it was legal. And they are granted. Um, just to talk about your point about a third country being used, would you support that idea? I mean, it is I going back gonna, to an old... I think we're going to um, have to investigate how we have a return scheme so that people can go to places that are safe. But I think what we know at the moment is that, uh, um, that we're, not have, we're not even processing people fast enough. I think what's interesting is anecdotally, right. Right. I know from having spoken to people who, who um, work with the um, asylum seekers in my own community, that they are already seeing that process speeding up. They're just already... The Home Office has like got in touch with them. They've been sat, and I think this is the other thing: is his mm. people quite often may well be economic migrants, sure. desperate and yeah. keen to be able to work, and are stuck, unable to do any of that. Are desperately pleased when the Home Office gets in touch well, and says, "Right, okay, let's get this process." We must acknowledge there are vested interests in the system. We want these delays. Well, there you know, the Grenfell inquiry was a lawyer's bonanza, paid for by us. A lot of the, the issues around whether or not people can be deported, the legal status. There's a lot of lawyers making a lot of money out of this. Well, I think and we need we to be realistic about, about that. It's a failure hang on, to hang invest on, hang in on. processing. There are a couple of things here. It is important, this idea, suggestion from Liam, about having a third country where you could send people whose asylum applications are either to be processed or deport uh, people to countries where there are no agreements with the UK, like Eritrea, like Iran, like Afghanistan in order to actually find a resting place for these people? Um, I, 
Look, I, I agree, and, and I think that, that, that that needs to be in place, not only as a deterrent, but also as an option. Um, but also well, we need to, to, to look at uh, Liam's wider point about vest, other vested interests. Look at the local councils who are going to really, really struggle if all of these uh, asylum seekers who are, are, are here currently are granted uh, asylum. And I mean, and by that I mean in the round, all the people who have applied for asylum, whether or not they are truly eligible. The strain on social housing in inner city areas is mm. going to go through the roof. And you only need to look at some areas of London to see how that is impacted by the number of HMOs that we have and the number of people who are living there. But, but this, actually, this actually goes to a point about the, the last government's black hole. They allocated £350 million <laughs> pounds a year for, for, for housing of asylum seekers. When you actually look at the books, they were spending £7 billion. Right? So this is not that uh, so suddenly this is going to be a massive burden on the state that wasn't there before. It already is a burden on the state because they're spending the money on housing the, uh, these people. Local authorities rather are spending than, that money. Yeah, they are. They, no, but, but, from but, but this but is something that the government the, now is going to have to deal with. On but on the third, so spending you, the money on processing it is important. If you think a third country, having a third country in this sort of uh, mix of trying to deal with people coming here and claiming asylum, what was wrong with Rwanda? Well, because it wasn't a safe country and it was clearly a gimmick, right? We ended up spend, sending more Home Secretaries there than we did any, any asylum seekers and anybody who, who has been rejected. So I don't think that's realistic. And that money is going to be much better spent cracking down on the gangs than it is... So how are you going to spend, how are you gonna spend money? Slight red herring and what we're going to end up looking at or what this government is going to end up looking at again is a return to offshore processing mm. rather than well, kind of moving people to a sort of some unidentified magical country that wants European to accept our own it. it's going to be offshore process, um, process, the, process your application for asylum somewhere outside the country and find a country that is prepared and to And would you agree to that or do you still want to see a Rwanda scheme where people are actually sent to have not just their applications processed but to stay there. I think you need to look at the end-to-end -end process and understand exactly what's going to work given the numbers that are coming and, the, and, the, and frankly, the amount of money that you have to spend on it. I mean, to Polly's point, she would like to see the implementation of safe routes as well as a, a, thir a safe... More third, safe routes, sort of, I think. So more safe routes, uh, a, thir a third safe country and also to... to um, process of people who are already here. Those things all cost money and unless we're going to put numbers on well, exactly what the well, priority is... Quite a lot of money was spent on Rwanda. I mean, James Cleverly... Spent. Well, let's just have a look at this headline. James Cleverly, um, Home Secretary formerly and now Shadow Home Secretary, also standing for the leadership, vows to resurrect the Rwanda scheme. Is he right? I, I think by the time we're in a position to do that, the situation could well have changed. So I, I wouldn't want to make up policy on the hoof, but we're looking at five years away from being able to make a decision on exactly what the right decision should be at that point. Are you surprised that uh, candidates for the Tory leadership are supporting the idea of resurrecting Rwanda? Um, no, I'm not. I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with Polly that there were very problematic issues with the Rwanda scheme itself. But, and again, I say this with regret, the idea of using third countries to process is now mainstream across, you know, centre-left parties across the European yeah, Union. The idea. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's not, not like it's some horrendous, sort of horrendous thing. And just on the Tory leadership contest... But it also, also, I mean, you could have offshore processing in France on the no, other side no, of the channel. You, you can, Rwanda, you, 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 which you, might can but you can, but mainstream EU parties are now looking at third-party processing mm. for the same reasons that our political and media class have been doing so. And, and one other thing I'd say on this Tory leadership contest, which I'm sure we'll come on to, this idea that you have to leave the ECHR to solve this small boat problem, that's just... Mm. It, it may be part of the solution, well, but many, many other EU countries in the ECHR, as we are, they deport people with a 30% success rate on average, as I've just shown. And that is another big discussion, yeah. which we'll leave for another day. Let's talk about the Great British <laughs> Energy wait. Bill. Um, has its second reading in the Commons tomorrow. Um, and you heard Keir Starmer, the Prime Minister, at the beginning of the programme, saying it will bring bills down. He tweeted this during the election. Labour's first step to set up Great British Energy will save families up to £300 a year off their energy bills. A vote for Labour on Thursday the 4th of July is a vote for change and so on. Uh, but let's have a look at this headline in The Telegraph from earlier this week, which actually accuses uh, Labour, Ed Miliband in particular, the Energy Secretary, betraying families with energy saving pledge, says Claire Coutinho. Shadow Energy Secretary says her successor's policy is rooted in ideology rather than fact. Uh, Polly, do you stand by Keir Starmer's claim, the Prime Minister 
Minister's claim that great British energy will reduce people's energy bills by up to £300 a year. That was based on independent modelling at the time and that was what we were, that's what the, the platform that I stood on and many other people stood on. And you stand by it. And I think what we've got to understand is that we will be lowering bills. The reality that bills are going up now is because the previous government failed to wean us off the, the oil and gas well, which gives us the, the, the energy spikes that we're seeing. So we need to be doing what we're doing in terms of renewable energy because it's cheaper, because it's cleaner mm. and because it's homegrown and increases our energy security. Liam, do you agree? Well, I agree in general that renewable energy is, is a good thing and this country's done pretty well. 40% on average of our electricity is provided by renewable energy. Coal over the last 15 years gone, has gone from 35% of our electricity to 1%. That's mm. a tremendous achievement. What I would say, though, is that unless electricity bills start to come down for ordinary people, the idea that moving to renewable energy, which I support, the, the political support for that will erode away. Let's just have a look briefly at some of the numbers. In the UK, the average household, these are numbers from what's called HEPI, uh, the Household Electricity Price Index. Mm. In the UK, cent euro per kilowatt hour, it's 35.5 households are paying as of July. In France, it's 30.6. Spain, it's 19.5. Sweden, it's 17. We have very, very expensive electricity for households and firms in this country. That's what the numbers so show. So will Despite work? our big renewable share. And it's, aside from the, the green energy company, it's all to do with how we trade electricity in this country. The model is broken. It's all linked to the marginal price of gas. Yes. And that is what's pushing up electricity prices, plus our lack of gas storage. And, and unless these electricity prices come down, and ordinary people feel the benefit no, from all I this can renewable understand stuff. Why ordinary people well, the short answer go. is that that model, that £300, you know, £300 quid off your bill, is based on the assumption that 98% of our electricity will be from clean sources by 2030. We're not on track to do that at the moment. Right. If Great British Energy, by you know, providing more capacity to invest in, in renewables, gets us to that point, then our bills will come down. If, if it doesn't, then our bills won't come down by anything like as much as we want to do. But so, you know, this is why it's the market reform that Liam yeah, is not necessarily And it does require market Because we already have very high renewable share things. and the most expensive electricity in Europe. That's it my point. It requires lots of other things. But at yeah. the moment, you know, we, we are short of where we need to be by 2030. And if Great to... British Energy gets us to that point, yes, our bills will come down and that's marvellous. But you need to look at the impact of the way that Labour are going about this. So in my constituency in Huntingdon, there's a new solar farm planned. It's 1,800 acres. It's bigger than Gatwick Airport. Six miles long and the energy minister said that that will be implemented irrespective of local wishes so so the fact that people locally are opposed to it is irrelevant it is going to be railroaded through because it is an NSIP project and therefore it will be implemented across good quality farmland and that is what the report has shown um, and that goes for the same for Sunica in the east of Cambridgeshire um, and all the other energy projects that they have online as well so Doing this and forcing this through for net zero ideology, and I'm not opposed to renewable energy, but I don't see that we should be impacting people unduly. In the, not and not in your backyard. <laughs> it's not, not necessarily in my backyard, but we need to be cl more clever about the way that we implement this. Look, why, we, why aren't we putting it on top of, of pop, car parks? One, why aren't we putting it on the roofs of houses, alongside railways? Why are we using good quality farmland and therefore jeopardising our food security? We're not jeopardising our food security. Well, we are. It's We're complete, using good quality farmland. No, it's complete farmland. nonsense. If you have ground, if you have ground-based solar panels, it's the cheapest way of being able to generate electricity electricity it's the most flexible you can reverse it very easily they're you on can, concrete bases you in can farmland the you impact can that has on soil it. quality no, on you the impact of soil it with, uh, with agricultural use you talk to anybody who understands the solar and uh, solar energy industry and they will tell you and indeed well, farmers themselves know that they can combine yeah, you, you can't, you can't farm possible. land that has solar panels on it you do you can use you can have that agricultural land you, uh, we alongside can't do any it. of this unless we solve our intermittency problem which ah. is big in the so uk because we, uh, we don't off, but, we often don't have sun the wind often doesn't blow, particularly in winter, when demand for electricity is high. But that is, is also highest. about... What we desperately need on, is baseload on. electricity, a stable supply that allows right. renewables to do their thing intermittently, which they can only ever do intermittently. So right. we need more nuclear... But that sounds that you are sceptical, then, that a massive expansion of what you are saying is intermittent and unreliable at no, times. No, I'm just honest. No, no, we, we need a smart grid. grid. We need a smart grid and we need storage as well as nuclear, right? right? What I find really interesting about this, and I can bore on about energy for quite a you long time, because I've been doing it for a bit, but the reality is you need to have a range of different technologies of that work together yeah. in order to be able to complement each other. I'm not sceptical, Joe. Saying no to one or just banking the, everything on, what, on another is not the way that we will solve 
Can I just come back, Jay, because you called me a sceptic, which in the context of this discussion is obviously extremely loaded word. No, no, no. I mean, sceptical about whether the plans will work. As you probably know. I'm not sceptical. I've just spent a lot of time studying our electricity market, which many journalists don't. And we desperately need baseload electricity in order for the renewables to work properly without threatening outages. We also the worst need... way to kill the public support for renewable energy mm. and pro-environmental policies in general is to is to not deliver much, much cheaper bills. We have almost the most expensive electricity in Europe. But and to threaten outages. The risk, though, The risk, though, Gabby, is that there is going to need a lot of investment yeah. up front in terms of subsidies, perhaps, to get some of these licences and projects off the ground. And that might mean bills going up initially before they come down. Well, that, in a certain part, is the idea of Great British Energy, that it becomes a vehicle to draw in investment. I think the biggest, the single biggest problem, probably, in terms of public and political support is just going to be the time it takes. You mm. know, we're going to come on mm. to talk, I know, in a minute about winter fuel allowance, but a lot of people are facing a pretty tough winter. Mm. The heating was going through the roof and saying, you know, in five years' time, your bills will be cheaper. Yeah. A lot of people are like, well, why can't I have cheaper bills now? And yes, it is unsustainable. We can't carry on in a situation where bills go up every winter by more than people can afford and government has to come in and subsidise it. You know, we, we need to, like, move to permanent cheaper, cleaner energy. Not, uh, but I do think the time that takes is going to be really, really difficult. And, and on that point, I think the, the, so the messaging around Great British Energy, people are on the general population under the impression that it is an energy supply company, yeah. well, it's not. It's, no, an, it's, it's, it's an entity investment vehicle. And we need to make that, well, the Labour government needs to make that very clear to people that this is not a new power company. Um, as well as that, you know, the 131 projects that were signed off last, last week uh, in the auction for clean energy, those were started in March under a Conservative government. And, and Ed Miliband was very keen to take full credit for those. But they cost 1.5 billion. The winter fuel allowance cost 1.4 billion. So Labour is effectively net zero means netting off clean energy against pensioners. Well, well, it's well, about you put a long-term investment Holly, and, 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 Holly, and let, having to fill a black hole that you left it, behind. Since you've made that contrast uh, with uh, means segway. testing... Uh, segway, <laughs> yes, to use the jargon uh, in the industry. Let me just show you uh, the Guardian headline. <laughs> Starmer to face test next week, because there's going to be a vote as MPs vote on limiting winter fuel allowance. Polly, are you comfortable with the idea of means testing uh, the winter fuel payments, which will mean millions of pensioners losing that money? Nobody wants to do this. But Nobody wants to but do this. the government's this. chosen to. We have, we have been forced to because of the consequences of the uh, big 22 billion black hole that's been so left the, to us by so the, the previous government. So the public government. sector pay rises are now at the expense the, of pensioners. I think if you don't want to cut waiting lists and pay nurses properly and talk to the nurses that I speak to who get food bank parcels because they're struggling... Speak to the people those in my constituency. I've had more communication a, about winter fuel pay, pay that's than a pay, anything else in the last two years. That's a pay review body's recommendation to nurses and doctors and we have fulfilled that obligation. Then do you we are a grown-up government that sits down around the table and negotiates <laughs> with trade unions rather than with turns no, their with back. No conditions well, hang on, that's that's absolutely ben, not true. do you want the government to reverse this? You don't want them to press ahead with this. I do not want the government to press ahead with the winter fuel payment. Let's just show you a clip of Kemi Badenoch, whom I understand you are supporting in the leadership contest. This is from 2022, in the last leadership contest, talking about this subject. Come back. There is a lot of dead weight in how we run government. I have people in my constituency telling me that they don't need the winter fuel payments that we give them because they can afford it. Why do we not have a more sophisticated mechanism for means testing? Those are the sort of long-term things which government should be doing, which we haven't been doing because we're focusing um, always on the short term on the news headlines uh, for tomorrow. Kemi Badenoch seems to be backing the uh, government's policy. I, I don't agree with the current cliff edge that we have in terms of those who are on pension credits get the winter fuel payment. Everybody else, if you're £1 over and the pension credit limit is not very high, do not get anything. And mm. that is the, the, the mistake sure. that's being made. That there are 84% yeah. of pensioners living in poverty will not be entitled. Right. To win. But, I mean, a lot of Conservatives uh, feel the same as you. But what do you make of, of what Kemi Badenoch has just said? I mean, she's a very senior politician in the party. She's running to be uh, the leader of the Conservative Party. She thinks perhaps it should be looked at. I mean, that was two years ago. You can find tweets from Rachel Reeves saying that she would protect pensions and protect the winter fuel payment. So I don't think that we can take things from years gone by and use them now as ammunition. How difficult is this vote going to be? 
for Labour. For Labour, I think it's going to be. I mean, the vote itself may not be enormously difficult. You've got a lot of new MPs who don't want to, you know, get themselves on the wrong side of the whip. You've got a lot of people, you know, anxious not to um, make trouble for Kistama. But I think in terms of the public, you know, it's not just, it won't just be Ben's post bag that's full of letters from people complaining about this. And it won't just be, you know, there are a lot of people who are going to be in genuine hardship. I mean, I, first time for everything, but I actually agree with Kemi. There are people who get this payment that don't need it and, you know, are spending it on your winter holidays. You know, mm. that's fine. But the trouble with this measure is that it comes down in the wrong place. It cuts down, it cuts, you know, it's too close to the bone. What you need is some means, maybe you tax the winter fuel payment. Maybe you take winter fuel payment away from people in higher council tax bans. There are ways of targeting wealthier pensioners and not targeting people who really can't afford this. But that's not what Rachel Reese chose to do. And now we're going to see whether the government can be flexible. It's a test of both Keir Starmer's agility, I think. You know, how can he... He's very good at setting a plan and sticking to it. That may not be the right thing to do this time. But it's also a test of the relationship between Starmer and Rachel Reeves, I think. You know, this is Reeves' first really big, difficult, controversial decision as Chancellor. She's taken a lot of heat for it. You know, how much do they trust each other? How willing is he to, to assume that, that, you know, that she's she's got this one right and they can write it out? Because the trouble with, you know, only... with sort of only um, going for the richer pensioners is it doesn't raise nearly so much money. Mm. You know, you're, you're talking about maybe a couple of hundred million rather than 1.5 billion. Liam? You've got to find that somewhere else. Sorry, Gary. It's, it's the age-old debate in welfare policy, isn't it? It goes right back to beverage. Means testing on the one hand, which means cliff edges that we've talked about, and I agree, we need tapers and this pension credit cliff edge is in the wrong part of the income distribution versus universal benefits when everyone gets it and a lot of people end up spending their winter fuel payment on wine or, mm. or, as, or skiing think... holidays, certainly in an affluent constituency like North West Essex, where Kemi Badenoch is. One thing I'd say about this is that, look, I remember going back to the early days of the Blair government. It won't do the party whips any harm in their own minds to have a bit of a bust up with the left of the Labour Party to show people, to show financial markets that the Labour leadership isn't totally, you know, in hock to the left of their mm. party. That's just basic politics. That's partly what's going on. But the other thing I'd say briefly, Joe, it goes back to our last uh, discussion about energy. This is a winter fuel payment which helps pensioners with their energy bills. But our energy bills, because we haven't got the guts to, to, to talk openly about the cost of renewables in this country, we just whack the subsidies for renewables on people's fuel bills, including mm. pensioners' fuel mm. bills. And unfortunately, that is what we call in economics regressive. It harms the poor most disproportionately because lower income households spend more of their income on fuel, on food and so on. So a subsidy for renewable it's companies for on bills is deeply disadvantageous. Leaving ourselves open to Putin's oil and gas is what causes pause, the, the price spikes. A little pause from the studio. Let's go into the chamber because we have got Prime Minister's questions uh, coming up in a few minutes' time. Um, it is the first Prime Minister's question since uh, Parliament has returned between Rishi Sunak and Prime Minister Keir Starmer. Um, and it does seem as if the honeymoon is over if it ever began uh, for Keir Starmer, Polly, because uh, his approval ratings um, have dropped uh, quite a bit actually within weeks of Labour winning that election. Let me just show you a couple of the headlines. The Guardian, public approves response to riots but Starmer's appeal fades, new poll shows. Uh, we can show you this in The Telegraph, Starmer's approval rating at lowest on record amid cronyism, scandal and The Express. Keir Starmer's popularity plunges to record low after winter fuel payments uh, betrayal, which we have just been uh, discussing. Um, Polly, why do you think it is his popularity's dipped? Well, I have to say, you don't come into politics to be popular. Mm. You definitely Thank go, goodness, hey. You, you, I was going to say, it's definitely the wrong, the wrong gig for you if that's what you're here for. I think, but remember, why, do you think? Remember, Keir Starmer is here for, for, for service and for <laughs> being able to get stuff done. And it is about being serious and about the long-term decisions. And sometimes you just have to take the knocks when they come and, and roll with those punches because ultimately we need to be able to get to a better place on all of these things. There has been some big things that have happened this summer. Mm. The riots, and, and it's interesting that the approval rate rating for him on, on dealing with those has been quite quite considerable but we also know that when you make unpopular decisions who know who knew you become unpopular like but things will not necessarily stay like that and people will start to see the the results of big difficult decisions as things get better so right how would you explain the cronyism then what what about it 
in I terms mean, of the impact not, that's I'm, had on his popularity. I'm really not taking any lectures from the Tories. I wasn't. About, um, I, no, I, I'm asking you, you about no, your you government. No, you might not be. You, you, you are the party in government. I'm leader, asking don't you talk over each other. Talk to each other if you can. You've got a leadership contest where people who will have to make some decisions about how they're going to defend their record in government, including when and how you made some some cronious decisions about who should be appointed to senior institutions. And I don't want to take any lectures about cronyism. But if you're not going to take any lectures, as you put it, uh, from a Conservative MP, answer the question, though, more broadly, uh, Polly, about this row over appointments. Were you surprised and taken aback? It seemed as if Keir Starmer himself was taken aback by the criticism of political appointees to civil service roles. Well, look, I, as far as I'm, I'm aware, all the processes were, t were, were, were followed and people have, have, um, ha have ended up in the roles that Ian they Crawford's have done. Ian donations weren't declared. No. Uh, look, as far as I'm aware, these people have got, uh, have got jobs that they're entitled to, to earn, to, to be in, and that is what the, the decision has been. Now, I know he's all th that the particular person you're talking about in the Treasury is no longer having a paid role, and that may well be the best And it is being looked into to, by to uh, Gizia Stewart. I mean, there is a review into this. Are you surprised that, despite the fact that headline said that Keir Starmer had done a pretty good job in terms of the response to the riots, that still yeah. uh, popularity sank a bit? It's really noticeable that if you look, if you look at the week-by-week -week trackers, it's it's not during the riots that it goes wrong. It's literally, it goes off a cliff after the emergency budget statement at the end of July. It, I think it really mm. has less... To, I don't think it's to do with mm. the response to the riots when most people felt the Prime Minister did roughly what they kind of expected the Prime Minister to do. And I don't think it's rights or wrongs of the cronyism row side. I don't think people are going, right, that's it. Wahid Ali had a plaster Downing Street. That's <laughs> it, I'm never voting for them again. You know, it really was about Good decisions impression. that hit people in the pocket, you know, and people thought, hang on, either thought, perhaps on the left thought, I really hope Labour in government wasn't going to do things like that, or on the right thought, whoa, they said they're putting up taxes. That's exactly what I was afraid of. We may, yeah, have, that's the a, we may have a minute or two uh, more. And just to remind our viewers, after Prime Minister's questions, which we will, of course, uh, take live and in full, there will be that Prime Ministerial statement from Keir Starmer on the Grenfell Tower fire report that we have spoken about in the programme. Just to go back, though, briefly to the Tory leadership contest, Ben, why are you backing Kemi Badenoch? Uh, Kemi is someone who I, I firmly believe in. Um, I've known her for a number of years. Um, she's uh, helped me in, in my progression in, into, into Parliament. But I think ultimately she is the very best person to stand up to Starmer and face down Farage. Let's hear PMQs. Mr. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I know the whole House will want to congratulate our Team GB Olympic and Paralympic athletes and support staff for their outstanding achievements so far. Mr Speaker, yesterday's incident in the Channel was shocking and deeply tragic, and our thoughts are with all those who have lost their lives and their families. We must have a renewed determination to end this. And Mr Speaker, the Chair of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry, Sir Martin Morbick, has today published the Inquiry's Phase 2 report, and I know that the whole House will be, uh, thoughts of the House will be with the bereaved, um, and the survivors of the Grenfell Power tragedy and the residents in the immediate community. I will be making a statement shortly after PMQs today. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later. Bill Esterson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I associate myself with the Prime Minister's remarks about the loss of life in the Channel and about Grenfell? The latest suicide figures are a sobering reminder of the misery caused by mental ill health. McGull Health Park in my constituency is a centre of excellence with high, medium and low security hospitals on the same site. The staff do an amazing job, but demand has gone through the roof, especially since the pandemic. Does my right honourable friend agree that it is essential that we have a the same level of priority for mental health care and physical health care in this country. Yeah. Yes, and I thank my honourable friend for raising this critical issue. I think so many are affected by the tragedy of suicide. Um, I'm pleased to hear about the work that he refers to, but uh, one million people are not getting the support, the mental health support that they need. And that is why we will recruit 8,500 mental health workers to treat adults and children and bring forward legislation to modernise the Mental Health Act 
uh, an act which I think is well overdue for modernisation. Yeah. We come to the Leader of the Opposition, Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I join with the Prime Minister in paying tribute to the Grenfell community? And we're going to rightly discuss that important issue shortly after PMQs. Um, can I also join him in congratulating our record-breaking Olympians and Paralympians yeah. on everything? that they have achieved. And lastly, could I just pay tribute to the hard work, bravery and dedication of our police. This summer, in challenging circumstances, they served our communities commendably and kept us all safe. Yeah. Now, Mr Speaker, government is about making choices, and the new Prime Minister has made a choice. He has chosen to take the winter fuel allowance away from low-income pensioners and give that money to certain unionised workforces in inflation-busting pay rises. So can I just ask the Prime Minister, why did he choose train drivers over Britain's vulnerable pensioners? Yeah. Mr Speaker, this government was elected to clear up the mess left by the party yeah. opposition and to bring about the change that the country desperately needs. Our first job was to audit the books, and what we found was a £22 billion black hole. Oh, it's no good them completely. Richard Hughes, the chair of the OBR, was very clear. He described it as one of the largest year over overspends against forecasts outside of the pandemic. His words. So we've had to take tough decisions to stabilise the economy and repair the damage, including targeting winter fuel payments whilst protecting pensioners. 800,000 pensioners are not taking up pension credit. We intend to turn that around. We're going to align housing benefit and pension credit, something the previous government deferred year after year after year. And because of our commitment to the triple lock, pensions are projected to increase by over £1,000 in the next five years. Rishi Sunak. Mr Speaker, the, the Prime Minister also inherited inflation back at target, yeah. interest rates being cut, yeah. unemployment low, and indeed the fastest growing economy in the G7, yeah. Mr Speaker. But that's, but that's not the point, because the Prime Minister now has to start taking responsibility for his own decision. Yes. And if, as he says, the public finance is a priority, it was his decision, and his decision alone, to award a train driver on £65,000 a pay rise of almost £10,000. And it was also his decision that a pensioner living on just £13,000 will have their winter fuel allowance removed. So can the Prime Minister explain to Britain's low-income pensioners why he has taken money away from them whilst at the same time given more money to highly paid train drivers? Well, Mr Speaker, we spent the whole election with him trying to tell the country that everything was fine, and this is the result they got. A massive mandate on this side to change the country. And if he carries on pretending everything is fine for ordinary people across the country, they're going to be there for a very, very long time. And I remind him that we inherited absolute chaos from the party opposite. We lost an average of three million working days a year to strikes under his watch. And you cannot fix the economy if the trains don't work, and you can't fix the economy if the NHS isn't working. And when it comes to winter fuel payments, uh, they're, having, well, they're having a competition, as I'd say. They're going to be voting later on today. Well, his shadow housing minister, we found this. She's the favourite, I think. Some of them will be probably voting for her this afternoon. She said, her words, I have people in my constituency telling me they don't need winter fuel payments. Why do we not have a more sophisticated mechanism for mean testing? That's their favourite, I think, in the contest that they are having. This is so nice. Oh, Mr Speaker, again, the Prime Minister talked about the public finances. The UK's public finances are more robust than almost that of any other major advanced economy. Here we have it. He inherited a lower, a lower deficit, a, a lower deficit than France, America, Italy. Or, 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 or. Well, I do point you to be quiet. I do mean it. I don't need a reaction back like that. Rishis. Well, the UK currently has a lower deficit than France, America, Italy and Japan. It has the second lowest debt in the entire G7. And he opposed every difficult decision that 
that we took to deliver that. So I certainly am not going to take any lectures from him on that, Scott. But he talked about protecting ordinary people. Well, last year, under the Conservative government, a low-income pensioner with just £13,000 received not only the winter fuel payment, but also hundreds of pounds of additional cost-of-living support, both of which he has now scrapped. Age UK have said cutting the winter fuel allowance is the wrong policy. And only this morning we have learnt that the vast majority of the poorest pensioners, pensioners in poverty, are going to see that vital support removed. So can he tell the House, very specifically to the pensioners that are watching, how much less support a pensioner on £13,000 will receive this winter? He talks about tough decisions. It's tough to inherit tough £22 billion black hole, which the OBR did not need. That is the inheritance. That's what they left. Now, back when they were in government, they'd have pretended it wasn't there. They'd have walked past it, put it in the long grass. We're not going to do that because we were elected to change this country for the better and stabilise our economy. No Prime Minister, no Prime Minister wants to do what we have to do in relation to the winter fuel allowance, but we have to take the tough decision to stabilise our economy to ensure that we can grow it for the future. And as I've said, we are working hard on pension credit. We're allowing housing benefits, which they didn't do for years, and over five years, it's a projected increase of up to £1,000 for those on pensions. We are tough decisions that they done. This is Sir uh, The government doesn't have to choose to take money off low-income pensioners in order to give it to highly paid train drivers. That is a choice that he has made, and it will be clear to any pensioners watching that he simply can't explain why he has made that choice. But, Mr Speaker, turning to another important issue. The government has suspended 30 of the UK's 350 arms export licences to Israel. It's a decision that the Chief Rabbi says beggars belief and will encourage our shared enemies. Can the Prime Minister therefore explain how his decision will help to secure the release of the 101 hostages still being held by Hamas? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, can I start by saying I think the whole House will be shocked by the horrific killing of six hostages in the last few days. And I know I speak for the whole House when I say that. The remaining hostages must be released. And we need a ceasefire to ensure that that can happen, that aid desperately needed can get into the region, and we can begin the path to a two-state solution. Now, he asks how we arrived at this decision. He knows very well, because the legal framework is clear. The latest guidance was issued in 2021 under his government. And that means that licences have to be kept under review, as they were by his government. And I think he probably knows the advice that was given to his government. He understands the framework. We've carried out the review in the same way and come to a clear legal conclusion and shared that conclusion, the assessment, with Parliament. We will, of course, continue to stand by Israel's right to self-defence, but it is important that we are a country committed to the international rule of law. That gives us the strength of argument with our allies on important issues. Uh, this is a difficult issue, I recognise that, but it's a legal decision, not a policy decision. And the, the, Prime Minister, the, the Prime Minister knows the framework and they shout, they issued the guidance, they know what the test is, that test has been assessed, we've come to a conclusion and we've put that before the House to consider. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I appreciate the Prime Minister's answer, but he'll know that decisions like this also have important and broader geopolitical implications. And he mentioned allies. It's essential that we maintain transatlantic unity in the face of terrorist threats and avoid any perception of splits between our two nations. So can he therefore update the House or tell the House what engagement he had with the United States prior to taking this significant decision? Prime Minister. I acknowledge the importance of working with our allies on all issues, as we have been doing, as I was able to make very clear 
uh, at the NATO summit that I attended uh, the, in the early summer. And of course, as he would expect, as the House would expect, uh, we have talked this through with our allies. They understand. They have a different legal. Si they have a different legal system. That is the point they made. Chunters from the. This is a serious issue. It requires serious consideration. And those. And the Prime Minister knows the legal framework. He knows the legal framework very well. He also knows that applying that framework, uh, uh, the, the facts of that framework, and arriving at a decision does not permit me to simply then say I'm not going to implement the legal decision and conclusion that's been reached. I don't think he's really inviting me to do that. Mr Speaker, not only do these decisions have geopolitical consequences, but they also have emotional ones too. And the Prime Minister took this action on the very same day as the funerals of Israeli hostages murdered by Hamas. It's something that the Board of Deputies described as a terrible, terrible message to be sending. And I hope the Prime Minister understands the hurt that has been caused, and can he take this opportunity to reassure Israel and the Jewish community that the United Kingdom and this House stands behind Israel and its right to self-defence? Prime Minister. Let me be very clear about that. I've said it before, I'll say it again. We absolutely recognise and support Israel's right to self-defence and have taken action uh, in support of that right of self-defence. I've made that repeatedly clear in all of my engagements with Israel across the region and with all of our allies. I absolutely stand by that. But in relation to licences, this isn't an Israel issue. It's the framework for all licences that have to be kept under review. It's the same test for all licences, as the Prime Minister knows. And having come, having applied uh, the law to the facts and come to a legal conclusion, I don't think the Prime Minister is really inviting me to put that to one side. We have to, uh, the Leader of the Opposition. This is, a, this is a serious issue. We either comply with international law or we don't. And we only have strength in our arguments because we comply with international law. I appreciate the party opposite didn't think that international law mattered, and that's why we got into that pickle that we did. Mr. Speaker, I welcome the Home Office's decision to close the Bibby Stockholm barge in my constituency. We all know this barge is a gimmick. First, it arrived late. Second, it cost the taxpayer a fortune. Third, it was laden with fire and disease risks. And fourth, it likely contributed to the death of a 27-year-old asylum seeker on board. So can the Prime Minister reassure my constituents that this unworkable gimmick and similar unworkable gimmicks will be closed down as we clear up the mess from the party opposite? Uh, I thank uh, my honourable friend for the question. Unlike the party opposite, we won't waste money on gimmicks. And that's why, within days, we ended the Rwanda scheme, we announced the launch of the Border Security Force, and we're preparing legislation to introduce counter terrorism powers to tackle gangs. And in the first two months, we've removed more than 400 people on planes who had no right to be here. Compare that, compare that with the four volunteers sent to Rwanda that cost £700 million. This is a government of service, not a government of gimmicks. Here comes the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Shrev Davey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I echo the Prime Minister's words about the terrible tragedy at Grenfell? Welcome the inquiry and look forward to the statement we'll discuss shortly. Mr Speaker, for the last 18 years, Norman has been a full-time carer for his wife, Roz, who has MS and Alzheimer's disease. Early this year, he was forced to go back to work to earn the extra money for the cost of caring for his wife. As their income is just a few hundred pounds above the limit for pension credit, they're set to lose their winter fuel allowance. Unless the Prime Minister listens to these benches and others, and changes this plan. So, if he doesn't, what advice does the Prime Minister have to Norman and Roz and millions of struggling pensioners as they face rising heating bills this winter? Yeah. Prime Minister. I, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for raising that uh, important question. I know how much he, uh, both politically and personally, has championed uh, carers. We have taken a difficult decision, and I'm not pretending it's not a difficult decision. Of course it's a difficult decision. 
because we have to stabilise the economy. We have to stabilise the economy. We went through, the first thing the Chancellor did was an audit. She found £22 billion pounds worth of un unfunded, unfunded spending commitments. We can't walk past that. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. That's what the last government did. We have to take tough decisions. We will put all the support in that we can. Obviously, talk to the learning gentleman about this, but we have to take the tough decisions in relation to this. They walked away from those decisions. That what got us into the mess in the first place. But you can't grow your economy, you can't fix your economy unless you stabilise it first. Ed Davey. Can I say to the Prime Minister, we recognise the appalling financial problems left to him by the last Conservative Government, but can I say no one understands the difficult decisions you need to take to balance the books as unpaid family carers like Norman. So many millions of pensioners have struggled over recent years thanks to the last Government. The number of pensioners who can't afford to heat their homes has doubled since 2010. 19. So will the Prime Minister support our campaign for more urgent action to invest in insulation and renewables so we can help pensioners and all families uh, make it cheaper to heat their homes every winter? Uh, yes, of course. And I remind him um, that there are 800,000 pensioners who are not claiming pension credit, which of course then deals with the winter payment allowance and so that's why we are taking so much care to ensure that we can get them onto pension credit. Um, again aligning housing benefit with pension credit, something they left undone for years, will make a massive difference and of course the triple lock which over five years uh, will mean pensions are expected to rise by up to a thousand pounds. Yes, we correct you. Thank you Mr Speaker. Four years ago the previous government ordered a review into the hormone pregnancy test drug Primidos and found that the drug had caused avoidable harm. Primidos was given to women in the 1960s and the 70s and resulted in many babies being born with severe disabilities. For the last 12 years, I have stood in this parliament and pleaded with the last government repeatedly to do the right thing. So I ask the Prime Minister today, will he commit to take a fresh approach to this issue and will he meet with me and the campaigner Marie Lyon to discuss how we can give closure to the families who have been denied justice for the last 50 years? Well, I thank her for that question and for her work uh, on the APPG. Uh, I am sympathetic to the families who believe their children suffered from these tests. Uh, and committed to reviewing any new evidence which comes to light. Mr Speaker, at the moment the Health Department is reviewing a publication from Professor Danielson um, and we will follow uh, the results of that uh, review. Um, and I am happy to ensure that the Health Minister does meet her to discuss this further. Gavin Robinson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for visiting Northern Ireland within the last fortnight and particularly for the time he spent with injured officers of the police service of Northern Ireland. He will know of their courage, but he will also know of the dogged determination of our Chief Constable John Boucher in his desire to see adequate resourcing for his officers who not only stand for law and order in Northern Ireland, but stand in the face of racism, violence and of an ongoing national security threat from dissident Republicans. So can I therefore ask him to earnestly and urgently engage in a discussion about uplifting the national security grant afforded to the, uh, the police service of Northern Ireland and ensure that the PSNI can face the challenges that we need them to face head on. Yeah. Well, I thank him for that question. And it was important for me to go to Belfast to meet the injured officers um, and to say simply thank you for what they uh, are, are doing and, of course, the impact it has on their families. I do recognise the difficult financial position the PSNI faces, and the Chief Constable and I have spoken about this on more than one occasion, as you would expect. I mean, predominantly, it is for the Justice Minister and the Executive to set the PSNI's budget and an operational matter for the Chief Constable in relation to how he allocates that, but I have been talking to him about what further support might be possible, um, because I do realise just how important it is to him and to the PSNI um, and to Northern Ireland more generally. Emma Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Last week, ticket selling websites like Ticketmaster left millions of Oasis fans furious. But worse still came minutes later when tickets started to be relisted online for thousands of pounds. This profiteering at fans' expense is not a one off. The cooperative parties campaigning for a new licensing body with real teeth to tackle this online touting. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that fans should be at the heart of live music and that urgent action is needed to protect fans against this horrid practice? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I do. And firstly, it's, it's great that OSS are back uh, together. I think, from what I've determined, about half the country is probably queuing for tickets over the weekend. Um, but it is depressing to hear of price hikes. I'm committed to putting fans at the heart of music uh, and end extortionate price resales, and we're starting a consultation to work out how best we can do this. Hurry yeah. across. Yeah. Yeah. Offshore Energies UK reports that the government's proposed windfall tax increases will cost our economy £13 billion, risk 35,000 jobs, and see investment in the North Sea slashed from £14.1 billion to just £2.3 billion by 2029. It also suggests that there's going to be a £12 billion cost in tax revenues. How does this proposal chime with the Prime Minister's goal of economic growth? And will he reverse this tax increase, which industry leaders are calling economic suicide for the oil and gas sector? Yeah. Mr Speaker, we're committed to the transition that is necessary in relation to energy to renewables, which will lead to cheaper energy, um, energy independence and the jobs of the future. But let me be clear, oil and gas will play its part for many years to come, and that's why I've been really clear about the support that we have for oil um, and gas. And I'm sure she and others uh, will want to celebrate the fact that just this week, Contracts for Difference secured a record 131 new clean energy projects, enough to power 11 million homes, and that is the jobs of the future. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will remember visiting my constituency in June, where we toured Germany Beck, a fantastic development of 600 new homes. But because of Tory dither and delay, it took the best part of a decade for that site to get through planning. You can grumble all you want, but my families are paying the price for their mistakes. Can the Prime Minister reassure me that this government will speed up the planning process so we can get more homes built, and will one of his ministers meet with me to discuss the housing crisis in York? Uh, Yes, I remember that visit well. Um, and was struck by the delays in planning because the system was broken by the previous government. We will deliver one and a half million new homes, Mr Speaker, drive economic growth and fulfil the dream of home ownership, shattered for 14 years under the the former government. Um, And that means changing the planning rules, a tough decision they were not prepared to make, to make that happen and to grow our economy. Thank you. Others to Carmichael. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last month, SAC, the operators of the new Viking energy wind farm in Shetland, were paid £2 million in order not to generate any electricity from it. Is there not something badly wrong with an energy market that pays big corporates not to produce electricity while the people living amongst the turbines endure some of the highest levels of fuel poverty in the country? So will the Prime Minister and the Government now look seriously at the idea of an islands tariff so that islands communities such as those represented by me and by his honourable friend from the Halen and the Near may see some genuine benefit for the community from hosting renewable energy developments such as this? Well, I, I thank the honourable gentleman for raising this issue, which is obviously of a considerable concern to him and his constituents. The, the National Grid, as he knows, does um, balance the grid by occasionally requesting some generators to stop when there's not enough capacity on the network. Uh, that's not good enough. That's not acceptable for the reasons set out in his uh, question. It's a problem that wasn't fixed over the last 14 years, but a problem we are determined to fix as we go forward. And I will make sure that a relevant minister speaks to him about the particular issue in his constituency. Dr. Peter Prinsley. Uh, Mr Speaker, thank you. As a surgeon from East Anglia, I welcome the measures the new government has taken to fulfil its mission to fix the NHS. 
In my constituency of Bury St Edmunds and Stowmarket, the West Suffolk Hospital is badly affected by rack, just like the James Paget Hospital in Norfolk, where I've worked for nearly 30 years. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that the rack hospitals must be priorities as the new government undertakes its review of the new hospital programme? I thank him for his question, and also uh, he brings huge expertise to this area. We, we have to reset the new hospital programme and put it on a sustainable footing. The last government promised 40 new hospitals. The problem is there weren't 40, there weren't new, and some of them weren't even hospitals. <laughs> hospitals with rack will, of course, including uh, West Suffolk Hospital, must be a priority, so we're reviewing the programme, and the Secretary of State will update Parliament as soon as possible. Sure. After 14 miserable years of the worst Tory government in modern times, the best this Prime Minister can offer the British people is things can only get worse. Well, for him and his calamitous opinion ratings, that's probably true. But why does he think he has such an unprecedented fall in his popularity? Is it his attacks on the pensioners? Is it leaving children in poverty? Is it the re-emergence of Labour cronyism? Or is it because his austerity is even worse than the Conservative variety? I remember when they used to sit here. It's a, it's a long way up and there's very few of them, so I don't think we need lectures on popularity. <laughs> I welcome this week's news um, on the changes to the government plans around Ofsted, including the removal of single word judgments. This is great news uh, for head teachers in West Lancashire who have raised this issue with me, um, along with other issues around Ofsted, um, and for parents who will have more transparency on the performance of schools. How does the Prime Minister see these changes developing a more positive relationship between Ofsted, government and schools, and improving standards so that all our young people can thrive? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we're committed to the best education for every child, whatever their background and wherever they come from. The current single grade does not work well, and that's why we're going to have a richer dashboard, which will give parents more information and allow intervention uh, more quickly, and that's why it's been so warmly welcomed across the country. Rebecca Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am new to this House, but I know that we all want our pensioners to live with dignity yeah. and security. Yeah, 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 yeah. In my constituency of Reigate, there are around 17,000 pensioners expected to lose their winter fuel payment this year. Of most concern are those just above the pension credit threshold who will be hardest hit. <coughs> Would the Prime Minister give consideration to broadening the eligibility mm. for the winter fuel payment so that those low-income pensioners who rely on it to stay warm can continue to benefit? Yeah. Can I welcome her to her place? And Rygate is obviously a place I know very well, as she uh, knows. But the, simple, the, 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 the reality is this. This decision has been taken because of the £22 billion black card. So responsibility, responsibility for the decision lies with the party that broke the economy. There's a reason we have a mandate for change, and there's a reason that this party is now sitting there, and that's because they broke the economy. And I'm not going to apologise for clearing up the mess that they left. Deirdre Costigan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. After 14 years of Conservative failure, crime and street drinking now blight areas of Southall Town Centre, West Ealing and Hanwell Broadway in my constituency of Ealing Southall. So can the Prime Minister set out how his government will take action to ensure our town centres are transformed into places where my constituency can finally feel safe again. Thank you. This is an important issue, Mr Speaker, and I've heard too many people say that antisocial behaviour is some sort of low-level issue. It really impacts lives across the country. We have to tackle it, and that's why we will put more police on the streets 
We will have more effective powers to deal with antisocial behaviour, and we will introduce Young Futures programmes to divert young people who are getting into trouble. Yeah. Sir, Sir Ashley Falks. Yeah. Yeah. Question number 14, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The Schools Minister will be happy to visit his constituency. Sir Ashley Falks. I thank the Prime Minister for his answer. Haygrove School is one of the top performing schools in Somerset. It is unfortunately one of those built by Caledonian Modular and now condemned as unsafe. So I'm grateful for the meeting with the Schools Minister. But can the Prime Minister give Haygrove School and the other schools affected an assurance that they will be rebuilt and quickly? Because those pupils and staff are still working in porter cabins. Yeah. I'm grateful. I do recognise how serious an issue this is uh, and why he raises it. It is of real importance. The Minister will visit, and the Department of Education is pursuing all available avenues for redress against the parties responsible for the issues um, at the school. But I will make sure that the Minister is fully briefed and has uh, a full discussion about this uh, when uh, that visit takes place. Sean Davis. Mr. Speaker, I'm a proud MP for a new town, but over the last 14 years, Telford has lost its a &E. Less police officers, GPs, teachers per head, and we've also had 40% cuts to our local government uh, budgets. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, back place like Telford rather than overlook us, as has been the case over these last 14 years? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank him for raising this issue, and I know he'll be a really strong champion for his constituency. We're a government that will be based on actions, not slogans, and that's why we'll have local growth plans, improve public services, and invest in transport links. We will fix the mess that they left after 14 years, and we will devolve power to those with skin in the game. Tim Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the last five years, there have been 10 fatal accidents on the A66 along the short stretch in the Eden Valley in Westmoreland. So in our community, we are naturally deeply concerned that the vital A66 Northern Trans Pennine project, which would make the roads considerably safer, has been put under review by this government. Will the Prime Minister take the opportunity now and end this uncertainty today, commit to this project and save lives? I thank him for raising this question about fatalities on roads, and that is a very serious issue in relation to the A66 and other roads across the country. Um, we have inherited a broken economy. We have to review what we're spending money on. We're going through that review, and we'll report back as soon as we can. Gurinda Josan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me in sending condolences to the family of Zadia Koch, a 13-year-old boy? who were uh, stabbed and tragically killed uh, in my constituency. Does the Prime Minister share my concerns uh, about the prevalence of young people carrying knives? And what more can be done to end this scourge that is destroying families and communities? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sure I speak for the whole House in saying our thoughts are with oh, yeah, Jazzy's family at this difficult yeah, yeah. time. This is tragic. Uh, it is senseless. And uh, the age just um, absolutely makes one shudder. Um, our mission is to halve knife crime. Zombie-style knives and zombie-style machetes will be banned from the 24th of September, and there will be a surrender scheme which has been started on 26th of August. And we are doing a rapid review on, on sale, uh, online sale of knives, which is often a problem in these cases. So we will uh, pursue that with determination, and I invite everybody across the House in light of this and so many other tragic cases, to join with us on that mission. Yeah. Final question, Karen Bradley. Thank, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Mr yeah. Speaker. Those of us from Staffordshire Moorlands are immensely proud of our beautiful area and unique identity. So can the Prime Minister guarantee that we will not be forced into a devolution deal or local government reorganisation against our will? Yeah. I think it's very important that local people have a say. Um, but it's equally important that we do devolve to those who have skin in the game. And one of the ways in which we can uh, restart our economy is making sure that those with skin in the game take the decisions uh, that are relevant to them and their area. 
That completes Prime Minister's questions. I'll let those who are leaving the chamber leave quickly before we start the statement. That is the end of Prime Minister's questions. As you heard there from the Speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, he is saying that people who need to leave the Commons chamber, MPs who have to go should do so now. You can see them uh, flowing out. But in a few moments' time, we will hear from the Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, as he gives his statement in response uh, to the publication of the second and final report on the Grenfell Tower fire disaster. It is seven years since that disaster claimed 72 lives. It was the worst residential fire since the Second World War and justice has yet to be done in the words of a, much of the testimony that we have heard from both survivors and families of the victims. Let's go back into the chamber. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning Sir Martin Morbick published the final report of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. But I'm sure the whole House will join me in thanking him, the members of the inquiry and the whole team for their dedicated work. Mr Speaker, I want to speak directly to the bereaved families, the survivors and those in the immediate Grenfell community, some of whom are with us in the gallery today. Sir Martin concluded this morning, and I'm afraid there's no way of repeating this that won't be painful. He said the simple truth is that the deaths that occurred were all avoidable, and that those who lived in the tower were badly failed over a number of years and in a number of different ways by, as the report lays out in full, just about every institution responsible for ensuring their safety. Mr Speaker, in the face of an injustice so painful, so deserving of anger, words can begin to lose their meaning. Seven years still waiting for the justice that you deserve. I want to say very clearly on behalf of the country, you've been let down so badly before, during and in the aftermath of this tragedy. Yeah. And while Sir Martin sets out a catalogue of appalling industry failures for which there must now be full accountability, he also finds, and I quote, decades of failure by central government. He concludes that in the years between the fire at Nowsley Heights in 1991 and the fire at Grenfell Tower in 2017, there were many opportunities for the government to identify the risks posed by the use of combustible cladding panels and insulation. And he concludes, and I quote, by 2016, the department was well aware of those risks, but failed to act on what they knew. He further finds that the department itself was poorly run and the government's deregulatory agenda dominated the department's thinking to such an extent that even matters affecting the safety of life were ignored, delayed or disregarded. So, Mr Speaker, I want to start with an apology on behalf of the British state to each and every one of you and indeed to all of the families affected by this tragedy. It should never have happened. The country failed to discharge its most fundamental duty to protect you and your loved ones, the people that we are here to serve, and I am deeply sorry. I also want to express my admiration for the strength it must have taken to relive these events when giving your evidence to the inquiry. And indeed, to see written down today the circumstances that led to the death of your loved ones. After all you've been through, you may feel you're always one step away from another betrayal. I get that, and I know I cannot change that with just words today. But what I can say is I listened carefully to one of the members of the inquiry, Ali Akbar, this morning, who said this. What is needed is for those with responsibility for building safety to reflect and to treat Grenfell 
as a touchstone in all that they do in the future. Mr Speaker, I consider myself someone responsible for building safety. And that is exactly what I will do and what I'll demand of this government. Mr. Speaker, today is a we'll leave the Prime the Minister, group. Keir Starmer, continuing to deliver that justice. statement in the House justice of Commons. Uh, it is a very sombre and sober atmosphere, understandably. As Keir Starmer said, survivors of the Grenfell fire tragedy and disaster seven years ago and families of those who lost their lives, some of them are in the gallery listening to this statement. He apologised, uh, the Prime Minister, on behalf of the British state as all the deaths, according to the chairman of the inquiry, Sir Martin Morbick, were avoidable. And he went on to say that you've been let down so badly. All the families that have been touched by this disaster at Grenfell Fire. He wants full accountability uh, from industry failures, but he also went on to talk about political failures over that period of time. Let me welcome our guests for this part of Politics Live for uh, the government, Sarah Jones, Industry Minister, Chris Philp, Shadow Leader of the House of Commons for the Conservatives, and the BBC's Deputy Political Editor, Vicky Young. Um, Sarah Jones, will Labour government accept all the recommendations from the Grenfell Inquiry? Well, I think the first thing I just need to say is to reiterate what the Prime Minister said. We're all thinking of those loved ones um, that lost their lives and their families and the community and it must be so unbelievably hard uh, to, to read the report today and to have been part of the whole process um, just having to bring back that painfulness again and again through the, the whole inquiry. Um, it's, it's a thousand page report and we will, we will of course look at all the recommendations. I've skimmed them uh, and the government will respond and of course we will do the right thing. The Prime Minister just gave uh, his um, uh, commitment that he's going to do the right thing. Now we know that um, uh, the government has been slow to act and that mistakes have been made through throughout uh, a long period of time and uh, I was elected in 2017 the Grenfell fire happened days after we've been pushing for uh, uh, more and more reform through that whole time and we still don't have remediation of a lot of the buildings of course sure. that still have the cladding so yes we will do everything that we need to do to put this right. Chris Philp, you heard what the Prime Minister said about the political failures, about departmental failures, about deregulatory agenda uh, that contributed, according to uh, Martin Morbick, in his report. Um, it is, and do you accept, because of the remediation that is still ongoing, I mean, according to data from the Housing Department, at the end of July this year, 4,630 residential buildings over 11 metres in height have been identified as having unsafe cladding. Only a third of those have had cladding removed. That's a grotesque failure of Conservative governments. Well, first of all, let me just echo the sentiment about the families of the victims. Uh, I went to one of the evidence and testimony sessions actually just a few months ago and heard directly from a father who had uh, lost his children. It was just heartbreaking seeing how many lives had been mm. affected by this, this awful and avoidable yeah. tragedy. It was really heartbreaking just to hear those, hear those testimonies directly, personally um, and, and firsthand. There are clearly a lot of lessons to learn. I, I hope the government um, do view the recommendations made in a positive way. Uh, I hope the people responsible, uh, which includes some in government, over 20 or I think 30 years um, are held accountable. The reporting, I haven't read the whole report obviously, mm. but the reporting I've seen yeah. says that the cladding companies actually um, falsified records and pretended the cladding was safe when in fact it wasn't. So I think all of those who are uh, culpable for this need to be held to account, but quite quickly because it has now been well, you know, seven years since mm, that terrible fire. But as you know, the indications are that it won't be that quick. It could be several years. Do you think that is justifiable, both of you? Would you like to see criminal prosecutions as well? Yes, of, of course. And I mean, we've uh, we've had a process where this had to Sir Martin Morbick had to complete his um, report before the criminal proceedings can begin. And and from reports today, that's going to take several months. But we want it to, uh, of course, come and when you meet. Um, people who've lost loved ones or, or people who were there on the night in the mm. fire service and you know what they want is 
justice uh, and that that has to be something that you know the police will take forward and, and I'm sure they'll do it in the right way but, but a lot of the families of course have been saying they don't feel there's any closure until the justice is seen to be done. Right here. but you've mentioned um, the companies I know you haven't read the full report nor have I um, but the failure over those seven years since the Grenfell fire disaster to remove all unsafe cladding from these buildings, people sleeping in these buildings not knowing mm -hmm. um, if a fire could start at any point. They've had to have 24-hour uh, fire security officers, but not in all of those uh, uh, buildings. Do you think it is one of the greatest stains on Conservative governments? Well, I think, as I say, the, the, the report says that the, there were warning signs that the state, the government, missed going back, I think, to 1991 or 1999. So I think successive governments should have spotted this a lot sooner. And Conservative and government since 2010, in, uh, so before yes, Grenfell Fire and post when they were told about so the I think So government, governments of both parties over a 20 wow. or 30-year period obviously missed warning signs, and that is wrong. And I think it's um, Keir Starmer apologised on behalf of the British state, and I think that was, that was right, because there were obviously failings, clearly made much more difficult because the companies concerned were essentially lying about the cladding. On the remediation point, yeah, look, it's important this gets done. My understanding, it was never my portfolio in government, but I understand that the most uh, at-risk buildings, so the very tall ones, with the most seriously defective cladding um, have been remediated. But there are, as you say, thousands of buildings around the country, uh, maybe not so tall, but they have cladding that should be replaced. There's a programme underway, and I'm, I'm fairly sure um, Sarah would confirm that the new government will continue uh, that programme and get it concluded as quickly as possible for, for obvious reasons. Right. Can you just first clarify for us, is the government going to accept all the recommendations? Well, obviously, I have only just received the report and I can't say on behalf of everybody, but I think what we just heard from the Prime Minister was was that he is taking responsibility for doing the right is thing. Now, I've skimmed some of the recommendations. Some of them are things that we've sure. talked about that yeah, we know would be sensible. Yeah. Of course, I can't say all of the recommendations right now, um, but, the, but, but what the Prime Minister said very clearly is this is his responsibility. It is going to be for the whole of government to look at each uh, part of that. And right. of course, we've had years now of passing the buck of responsibility between developers and freeholders and mm. leaseholders have ended up mm. footing the bill for lots of this. The whole thing is, is a mess in terms of what's gone on subsequently. So we need to put all of this right. Um, Vicky, what do we know so far in terms of what the government may do in terms of their response? Well, I think you're right. It's, it's non-committal. I mean, we've had Keir Starmer he did put out a very brief statement mm. saying that you know he will examine what this says and you know to some point of course it's fair enough it's mm. a huge report it is of course they should have time to look at it he is obviously the person who is in charge as this is now the conclusion to this bit if you like and he is the one who will have to come up with uh, the responses uh, today really I think for him it was about finding the right words I think mm. you know the way he spoke directly to the families and ones that were there uh, was quite powerful but I also think there's a sense for or everyone who's looking at this, you feel like you've heard these failures before mm. in different um, mm. in different ways. The contaminated blood scandal. Mm. It's apologising on behalf of the state of several different governments. But there's an element of trust here, isn't there? I just think people watching this will think this keeps happening. Mm. Something is going wrong, and in this case, it's incredibly complicated. And yes, when I think you know incompetence, dishonesty, greed. Mm. If you've got dishonesty mm. from the manufacturers, it's very hard to get beyond that in many ways. Mm. But the fact that there were people in government who knew there were problems mm. and didn't act on it, that is very reminiscent of the contaminated blood scandal. And I think people will be wondering what's happened to a system and to a political system where people know there's problems and they don't act on it. Well, following on from what Vicky has just said, Sarah, mm. for people watching the programme who perhaps are living in buildings with unsafe cladding, will their lives materially change with this change of government? I think, um, yes, I mean, when it comes to housing across the board, whether it's people in private rented sector, whether it's leaseholders, yeah. uh, whether it's people who are living in, in uh, buildings that need fire safety work, um, we're going to have to work but, on all of yeah, these but let's things. let's just stick with this, because so, yes, this is what I we have, look at. I Will have, it um, materially change in the near future if you are living in a building with unsafe cladding? Um, yes, I would absolutely hope so. And the Deputy Prime Minister um, mm -hmm. met last week with a whole range of the stakeholders who are the ones who are going to be responsible mm -hmm. for removing this to make sure we speed up uh, the process, which absolutely has to be done. I have people in Croydon. Uh, there are blocks in my own in my own constituency where people have been dealing with having uh, uh, having to pay for some of this work. The work being uh, taking a very long time. People's flats being worth nothing while the mm. work goes underway. There is there is a whole. Uh, 
there well, is a whole multitude of things we have to fix here. Um, but to the point about trust, I think that's absolutely right. And it is on us as the new government yeah. to show that we are working at pace, that we are going as fast as possible, well, that there's will, no complacency sure. here. Well, we you will need follow. to hold us to account we, for that. We will, and we will. Yes. Um, we will uh, follow, obviously, all the developments and the response from the government and some tangible changes and improvements that the government will no doubt be promising uh, to make to people who have lived uh, through this and are still living in those buildings uh, with cladding. You can uh, follow all the coverage on the response to the Grenfell Fire Tower across uh, the BBC, uh, no doubt, over the next uh, few days. Let's talk about something else we discussed um, at the start of the programme, and that's the government's decision, an early decision, uh, once it won the election, to means <coughs> test the winter fuel allowance uh, for millions of pensioners. Um, this headline in The Guardian, Starmer to face test next week because there's going to be a vote as MPs vote on limiting winter fuel allowance. Um, just before we get to that, Sarah, there are a couple of phrases that have been used. Keir Starmer said that decision, which saves, I think, around £1.3 billion, pounds, not insignificant, uh, but a fraction of what is a £2.274 trillion pound economy, when Keir Starmer said it was essential for stabilising the economy, what exactly did he mean? What he meant was that when we were first elected and we were presented with this £22 billion uh, black hole that we are faced Amazing. with, uh, which is not made up... Well, in, 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 but why is it essential? So, for a number of reasons, but firstly, the announcement, just going back to that announcement, mm -hmm. was not just the means testing. We, uh, we cancelled some road projects. Um, we have, um, we're reviewing the hospital building programme. Sure. We asked government departments to make uh, in-departmental uh, mm -hmm. savings so Fine. that we could uh, fund no, um, the pay review. Without this, it is a package. Without this, oh, okay, and I think you say without, it's a package, but without this announcement, he said this policy, Keir Starmer, mm -hmm. and one of your colleagues, Lucy Powell, said there would have been a run on the pound um, uh, last week or at the beginning of this week. It, without this policy, are you saying, and is Keir Starmer saying, the stability of the economy would have been at risk? So I think what uh, this was set out by Rachel Reeves at the weekend in an article, you can read it, what she said is economic stability was at, uh, at risk. We had to uh, act uh, to show and to reassure the markets that we were um, taking action when we found this black hole and that economic stability is what enables you to sure. get a mortgage, All it's right. what enables a business to grow, it's what enables the government to provide public services, so it is essential. Now, of course, um, we are making sure uh, we need everybody who is eligible. We know that there's an issue with pensioners mm. sometimes not feeling they want to claim benefits, but there are 880,000 people who are not claiming benefits who should be, right. uh, who could yes, then get uh, it. Yeah. And there are other um, uh, actions that we're taking around housing benefit um, and, and uh, around well, let me the just household bring Chris, support fund. Let, let me just so, bring in so Chris we Phil. also need to make sure those very much most in need are getting the support that they need. Right. And we'll talk about perhaps the cliff edge if we have time before the end of the programme. There are Conservatives who think this is quite a good idea that actually reducing government spending uh, for pensioners, some of whom, I grant you not all, are wealthy enough to do without it. What do you think? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head straight away. I mean, some people have mused in the past about the very richest pensioners, mm. but of course what this measure that Labour are introducing mm. does doesn't just target the richest pensioners, it targets almost all pensioners right down to income levels less than half the minimum wage. It uh, withdraws the winter fuel payment from 84% of pensioners living in poverty. Let me just say that again. 84% of pensioners living in poverty will lose the winter fuel allowance as a result of the choice that Labour have made. No Conservative, I can tell you, not a single one agrees with that. And this is a choice, right? Labour came in, well, they've concocted this story about a black hole. Over half of the amount of over half of the amount of money over half of the amount of money which they refer to is for above inflation public sector well, pay rises, which their union pay masters on your have, desk have demanded. And you've made no they, the Labour choice the, let me finish Sarah. The Labour government made a choice All right. yes, to award these enormous pay increases instead and of looking after impoverished Pensions. Well, let me just and play you, hang on, hang on. Let me, very unhappy we'll, about that. well, let me just play you this though from Kemi Badenoch, whom I believe you are uh, supporting in yes. the leadership contest, because she actually agrees with the Labour government. Let's have but a look. From no, 2022, but let's have a look. There is a lot of dead weight in how we run government. I have people in my constituency telling me that they don't need the winter fuel payments that we give them because they can afford it. Why do we not have a more sophisticated mechanism for means testing? Those are the sort of long-term things which government should be doing, which we haven't been doing, because we're focusing um, always on the short term, on the news headlines uh, for tomorrow. 
Chris? Look, Kem Kemi is very clearly there, referring to the very, very richest pensioners. Oh. She is not, was obviously not there, talking but, about pensioners in poverty. Testing. Well, she's talking about the very richest pensioners, which, and she's not talking about pensioners in poverty. And those are the people that the Labour Party is taking benefits away from. It's morally wrong, and their own MPs disagree with it. How difficult is this going to be next week? Uh, the vote itself, yes. not necessarily, but the issue. Well, I mean, Labour has a huge majority. It will get through. The question is going to be, how does Keir Starmer react to any of his own ah. MPs who decide to vote against him? Because if you think back to uh, the previous criticisms of the two-child benefit cap, he did withdraw the whip from seven Labour MPs. So is he going to do the same if there are Should he do the same, that? Sarah? Yes or no? Well, look, we expect colleagues who are, who are elected on a Labour ticket, we expect them to, to vote with the government. So it's not a decision for me, it's for the whips. But and uh, Very briefly, the six candidates standing for the Tory leadership will be whittled down to five by the end of the afternoon. Bye-bye.